Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining Earth Echoes STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection featuring Ratna Suthar today. And my name is Lily and I'm a freshman at Virginia Tech University and a member of Earth Echo International's Youth Leadership Council. And Earth Echo International is a nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change the planet. And our free programs and resources have reached more than 2 million people in 146 countries. And today's live event is part of STEM Explorer, which is Earth Echo's program that brings inspiration to life by telling the stories of dynamic female professionals in STEM careers during live virtual career connections. And we just wanna thank our program, our program sponsor Raytheon Technologies for their support in women in STEM. And also, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can send in questions anytime for our expert, and we're going to answer these throughout today's event. And if you're joining via Zoom, please use the Q&A feature, and we'll answer them on there, either live or through the chat. And if you're on YouTube, please use the comment section, and then we'll take those comments and answer them into uh, the Zoom. And yeah. Now let's get started. I'm so happy to introduce today's STEM Explorer mentor, Ratna Suthar. Uh, welcome, Ratna. Thanks, Lily. Gonna uh, go I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, I'll go ahead and start with the introduction. All right, I'm, I'm Ratna. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Florida uh, and I'm working um, in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering. Um, and I just wanted to get into a little bit about where I'm from before I get started. Um, um, well, I, I was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, my parents are immigrants uh, from India and I've moved to Florida about uh, 10 years ago. Oops. So Ratna, let's, uh, why don't we start off by, so what do you do for a living? Thanks, Lily. Yeah, so I am a PhD student, um, and typically PhD students, uh, I'm a student just like you, um, we typically focus on research. So a lot of my work entails data collection, giving talks, attending talks, uh, publishing papers, and things like that. And um, agricultural engineering is, is a bit of an ambiguous term, so I, I'm going to ask a question to you guys. What do you think an agricultural engineer does? Do you think it's mainly uh, what's in uh, the picture A, which is uh, a lot of mathematical and modeling and data analysis, or B, a lot of field work and in the production fields, or, or C, more lab work and sample analysis? What do you guys think? So we have in the chat a couple Bs. Okay. Uh, we have a C. Okay. Uh, we have another C. Okay. All right, all right. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you guys the answer is all of them. So I personally have done a little bit of everything uh, in my career, um, but, but agricultural engineering is basically all fields of engineering applied in the realm of agriculture. So. A lot of my colleagues, they have very diverse backgrounds ranging from uh, biology to mechanical engineering to agribusiness. So um, it covers all different disciplines and various, um, various types of backgrounds uh, of people can work in agricultural engineering. And my work and a lot of work in agricultural research is typically centered around food availability or what they call food security. Um, and that basically means ensuring that we have uh, access to enough food that is safe and nutritious um, from a physical, social, and economic aspect. And some of the challenges with food availability and food security is that we have a rising global population. Um, and in, in conjunction with the ongoing challenges of malnourishment and, pro and poverty, um, uh, it's a challenge to have enough available food. So one of the solutions uh, to combat this is increasing our, increasing our production so we can have a more efficient production system. 
And another challenge uh, is food loss and food waste. And a lot of people don't know that over one third of the food that is produced is actually wasted. Um, and this, this is a really big, big deal. So a lot of the interventions also focus on reducing these losses in the food chain. And that's where my research focuses on. So losses in the food chain can occur at any stage. This is a very general diagram of uh, a food production system. We have production, processing, and then re reaching the retail and food service outlets, and then ultimately ending up at the consumer's home. So my research focuses on the post-harvest portion of this, so everything after production. And um, there are lots of terminologies out there like food loss and food waste. Typically food, uh, food, uh, food loss uh, uh, refers to the decrease in a uh, food quality or quantity um, that occurs before reaching the retail and food service agents. Um, and this is mainly caused by inefficiencies in the food supply chain, such as lack of access to technology or infrastructure. Um, and in addition, natural disasters or pandemics can also play a role in this. Um, and the food loss that occurs at the more retail and consumer level is referred to as food waste, which refers to the food that's fit for human consumption, but it's being discarded. And usually it's due to oversupply or consumer shopping habits. Um, and, and my area of research focuses specifically on the fruits and vegetables aspect of this. So we refer to this as post-harvest losses. So when we waste food, we also waste a lot of the inputs that were put into producing this, this food. Um, and mainly uh, one of the major things is water. So over 70% of the global fresh water is used for agricultural purposes. And this is not just in the production sense. So it's not just for irrigation, but it's also used in the post-harvest processes such as uh, the washing and rinsing of the produce after it's harvested. Some of the other resources include land, energy, the labor it takes to pack, uh, harvest and pack these products, um, the cost of all the packaging and materials, as well as a lot of the love uh, from the growers who are usually generational producers and dedicate a lot of their uh, time to this uh, practice. So the climate consequences of our food waste is that when, when food usually goes to the landfill after we throw it away, it produces something called methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's even more toxic than carbon dioxide. And so the EPA has come up with some, um, some food recovery strategies that are alternatives for uh, preventing food from going into the landfill. And although this isn't a main area of my research, I think it's important to bring this up. Um, my research mainly focuses on the source reduction and, uh, and reuse. So how to prevent the losses from happening through technologies. But as you can see here, there are, there are many tiers here. So using the extra food to feed hungry people, feeding animals, other industrial uses such as biofuel uh, conversion, as well as composting. And then as a last resort, the landfill and incineration. So fruits and vegetables in particular, they, they go through more than one third uh, of the losses. They actually have 45% uh, post-harvest losses. Um, and this really depends on the region. Um, in developing countries such as Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the loss happens at the beginning of the supply chain. So more at the production and processing levels. Whereas in developed countries like the United States and industrialized uh, Asia, um, a lot of the loss happens at the more retail and consumer levels. And you can see that in this little infographic here is the majority of the post-harvest losses happen more at the retail and consumer level. And this is data from the United States. Uh, so Ratna, why do food losses occur? That's a great question. So food losses occur because Fresh produce is alive, just like us. Um, it undergoes a lot of the same chemical processes that we do. It undergoes respiration, releases heat, it can lose moisture, and it can even get sick and die. And the quality of the produce is something that's determined at harvest. It usually cannot be improved after it's harvested. So the purpose of 
the research in the area of post harvest science and technologies is usually to help slow down this aging process and help prolong the shelf life. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the physiology behind um, the fresh produce. So usually slowing down the respiration and aging process consists of lowering the temperature. That's the number one way to slow down the aging process because it does undergo respiration um, just like us. It requires oxygen and it outputs CO2. Um, usually modified atmosphere is another way of reducing the respiration. So filling up the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. So um, it has less oxygen to take in and slows down the respiration. Another way is also to put it in the optimal storage conditions. So this includes not just the right temperature, but also the right relative, uh, the right humidity. And also lighting can play a role in this. And lastly, there, there are a lot of technologies which include like different types of temperature treatments, different types of edible coating, which can also protect um, the produce and elongate its shelf life. Another important chemical agent is ethylene, which is a, a hormone that's found in plants and it's responsible for the ripening process. So it's responsible for what turns the green tomatoes into red. Um, and it's normally found in a gaseous form. And tomato is actually considered in the class of climacteric fruits. And these are fruits that can ripen after they're picked. Um, and they produce a lot more ethylene than the other class of fruits, which are the non-climacteric fruits, which cannot ripen once removed from the plant. So some fruits such as bananas, apples, uh, they produce even more ethylene gas than other climacteric fruits and therefore um, it's important when you're looking at storage considerations to keep the climacteric fruits from the non-climacteric fruits uh, because they, they will actually have some detrimental effects. Um, so I'm in college right now studying chemical engineering and I'm thinking of minoring in agricultural science. And I'm really fascinated in the work that you're doing because I feel like what I've noticed a lot, this also has to do with like food science, is the not only the production, but also the availability of this food. So like when in my town, we have so many grocery stores and farmers markets with a lot of um, like fresh produce avail available for people. And when I moved down to college in Virginia, I've seen that we have just about really like one grocery store mm -hmm. and there's some produce, but it's not. And I, see, I don't know if this is because they haven't figured out how to be able to transport all of it, mm -hmm. or if it's just not an area where it's in high demand. So I think it's really, really interesting what you're working on. And also, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, there are two really, really good documentaries on Netflix about this kind of stuff called, um, one called Rotten, and the other one is Kiss the Ground. And so I just wanted to let everybody know if you did want to check that out, it's super, super cool. And it really lets you show where kind of the food that you're getting comes from because it's a lot more complicated than a lot of us think. And so that kind of brings us to our, ne our next question for Ratna. So how does your work contribute to a sustainable future? All right, thanks, Lily. I actually, I'm super interested in what you said because um, about the food availability, because I know that now we have uh, in terms of our food systems, we're leaning more towards the decentralized food system. So incorporating more food hubs and co-ops so that food is available in areas that are not near like a major trade hub. So that's definitely something that's uh, developing now. But I'll go back to uh, the question about sustainable futures. So thank you for asking that actually. So um, the UN in 2016, the United Nations created a series of 17 goals as a call to action, uh, which partners with public and private sectors that emphasize the increase that we need in food security and also reducing our stress on the natural resources. So they range from hunger, poverty, education, um, um, sustainability in all, in all senses. So one of these goals, uh, specifically goal number 12, it actually targets uh, food loss and food waste. And it actually specifically has the goal of reducing our food loss and waste by half by the year 2030. And it's important to monitor our progress towards this goal. Um, and more importantly, it's really challenging to measure and monitor what's not measured. 
So my research focuses on measuring uh, the post-harvest losses by formulating a model that we can use as a tool to measure and monitor our progress towards this goal. And some of the challenges are that uh, there's not one standardized way of measuring food loss. And also a lot of the data, because it's from private industry, it's usually not readily available in order for us to, to quantify. So these are some of the challenges and I, in particular, am working on Florida tomatoes. So Florida is number one in the US production of tomatoes. And as you can see, a lot of the tomato production areas are focused in South Florida. And we focused on tomatoes because it is a very complex crop. It's very sensitive to environmental conditions. And it, it's of high economic importance because uh, Florida is the number one producer. So, uh, the typical post-harvest uh, operations for tomatoes is that they're usually harvested green, and a lot of people don't know this. They're harvested green, um, and when they're harvested, they're sent to a packing house where they're washed um, and packed, and then they're sent to a repacker where they're further graded and sorted. Um, as you can see in this middle picture here, that's the grading and sorting, where they're uh, sorting out all of the ones that are even the slightest bit of pink. Um, because they want to keep the tomatoes green for as long as possible until they reach very close to their destination. So at the repacker, they further refine this product down into what the buyer would want. Um, so they might have some very specific quality standards that they're looking at. And then once it reaches the distribution center, um, it's mixed in with other products, say, say Publix would have a distribution center. So the tomatoes would be mixed um, in a load with, with other, other vegetables before it's sent to the retail outlet. Um, and, the, and usually at the distribution center is where the tomatoes are gassed with ethylene to turn red so that the later in the chain that they turn red, the less uh, susceptible they are to being damaged because at the green stage, the tomatoes are a lot stronger and resilient to any sort of mechanical damage or harm. And when they're red, they're, they're way, way more sensitive. So they like to do that as late as possible. So uh, without getting into too much detail, the type of model that I'm working on, it basically takes in, in all these inputs that happen during the operations and it outputs um, some sustainability measures, including the water and energy use, as well as the amount of post-harvest losses. And we do this by uh, using some biological functions uh, about ripening. Um, and we are also looking at some uncertainties like uh, at the maturity at harvest. Like I said before, the quality is usually indicated at harvest. So we're looking at some uncertainties in the maturity at harvest and seeing how that affects our food loss because um, Tomatoes are supposed to be picked at mature green, but the difference between mature green and immature green is very hard to tell without cutting the tomato open. So often there's a large amount of immature green that's also harvested and this contributes to loss. So those are like some of the things that we're, we're looking at, but I'm not gonna get into just too much detail there. Um, so right before we move on to the next question, we've had a lot of comments coming in um, asking about how to store food and some people have some different ideas on the best ways to store food and I was wondering if you could go back to the or not go back but just kind of explain the best way to uh, store different foods so we can kind of minimize our food loss and I'll give you just some of the um, comments that people said um, they had ideas of putting things in the fridge, placing the roots in water when they bring them home, uh, storing them in salad containers and preserving or dry them, drying them. I don't know if you wanted to go a little bit further into that. Sure. Yeah, actually, there are some really great resources because, like I said, every fruit is very different. Um, and I didn't, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but a lot of fresh produce um, that are subtropical, like tomatoes or mango, they actually should not be refrigerated because they actually get more damaged. So subtropical fruits like that, when they're kept at colder temperatures than what they, they need, they actually get something called chilling injury, which um, it's it shows up after it's removed from the overly cold conditions and it manifests in a physical form. Like it's usually seen as like a scaly texture, but it also affects 
affects the flavor and quality. So that's just that's just one small facet of it, but there are so many useful um, resources for this, including a lot of the uh, university extension websites. Um, I know UF Post Harvest Extension has some uh, information on how to best store fruits. Um, and then I think there's one by Foodprint. There's a website called Foodprint and they go into detail. They actually have a nice little table of how to store each fruit and vegetable. Um, but yeah, usually I, I would say one of the big things is, is that refrigerating isn't always the solution. <laughs> okay, that's good to know, thank you. Um, so we can move to our next question. So what's one of the coolest parts of your job, do you think? Uh, okay, let me start sharing again. All righty, so the coolest part of my job, um, I would say it's learning where our food comes from because before I got into this field, I really had no idea I, like that tomatoes were harvested at Mature Green and all of the meticulous grading processes they go through before they get to us. So that's one nice, uh, interesting thing. And another thing is like food quality, which I'm gonna get into now. So, um, you know, consumers buy according to a very like qualitative scale, right? Um, but to me, it was really interesting to find that food quality can actually be measured. So um, I actually, was working in a lab during my undergrad where they looked at how to measure food quality. And so some of the aspects are color and firmness. So for example, you would measure this uh, color using some spectroscopic method and firmness would be measured by, you know, how much force it takes to compress the fruit by, by a certain, you know, depth. Um, so those are some of the, the key physical attributes. And then some of the chemical attributes uh, are more related to nutrition. So we would use some very, very typical analytical chemistry techniques to measure the vitamins and minerals. Um, suppose like in tomatoes, we would look at vitamin A, vitamin C, antioxidants, because these are very key components of nutrition. And they actually change um, as the fruit is exposed to like different types of storage temperatures. So it actually will degrade. And we were looking at, at how they change. And using that information, we were kind of targeting like, okay, what is the optimal way to store these fruits? So, uh, and then also lastly, the more, uh, more most qualitative attribute is the more sensory food quality, which includes the taste and smell. And so when I was uh, working in this lab, to me, it was really interesting that you can actually quantify quality. And then this is something that determines the, the shelf life. And as I said, it's usually measured using destructive techniques. So um, it's really hard to measure without actually doing all of these assays. And uh, the end of the shelf life is actually when the product is no longer fit for consumption. And, and that's, again, a very subjective thing. So to me, um, that, was, that was something that really inspired me to kind of uh, go, go into this field. And I thought it was super cool. So I've noticed with a lot of the people who go into working with agriculture and different food production, um, I've noticed a, really a lot of different inspirations or reasons that people want to go into this. So what's something that's inspired you to do this work? Well, um, I would say that when I started off as, a, as an undergrad, I was a, I was a chemistry major. And um, actually my parents wanted me, you know, my parents were immigrants. So, you know, job security was very important. So they wanted me to go into a vocational career, something medical, you know, as parents usually like. Um, so they wanted me to be uh, like, uh, I think it was an x-ray technician. So actually when I was taking the prerequisite courses for this like pre-med type of field, uh, one of the courses I was taking was chemistry. And I, I absolutely loved it because to me, um, I was really fascinated by how things work. And once I took a few chemistry courses and I took organic chemistry afterwards, I was like, okay, this is what I want to major in. Um, and so while I was doing that, I, I did take a lot of, of pre-med classes and a lot of them were more centered around pharmacy, but something that I was super interested in was going into food science. So I either wanted to go into food or pharmaceuticals. So um, pharmaceutical research was like really, you know, easy to find where I was at the University of South Florida because they do a lot of work there in like drug discovery, but food science was kind of rare. So as I was looking, um, I actually got the opportunity to do undergraduate research 
um, in this food quality lab that I was referring to before. And when I was there, um, I worked on, in that lab, they worked mainly on specialty crops. So strawberries, blueberries. And at the time when I was um, beginning to work there, they were actually doing a really cool project on MREs, which are meals ready to eat. So to me, it was like very cool and very applied. Uh, like I was applying all the things that I learned in all of my chemistry classes to how different sorts of um, chemical reactions happen, like how antioxidants were oxidized um, and, and how that affects the quality of the produce. So when I was working in that lab, I did a small undergraduate research project with uh, strawberries and I was working on developing a protein-based assay to analyze the quality. So um, here you can see in this picture, I used liquid nitrogen to freeze up the tissue and kind of lyse all of the cells. And then in the picture on the left here is uh, part of the protein, quantif like the, the analytical chemistry technique I was doing to measure the kind of protein. So I would say this was really the, the stepping stone uh, for, for me to kind of go into this field because before this opportunity, I had no idea that this kind of work was actually done. Um, I didn't know anything about, you know, the area of post-harvest or agriculture, you know, to me, agriculture was very, as what, like traditionally what you would think, like working in the field, you know, more, more on the production side, but uh, I was really happy to learn about this more like post-harvest aspect. So after I finished um, my, my degree, I was super interested in continuing to do research. And that's when I, um, I applied for the master's program at the University of Florida and in their agriculture and biological engineering department. And, and here I got the opportunity to work a little bit more on the pre-harvest side of things. So how pre-harvest factors affect post-harvest quality. And, and because of that, I was actually looking at biochar and um, biochar is actually, do you know what biochar is? No? It's actually, it's actually charcoal made from agricultural waste. So things like, um, you know, the inedible parts of crops, um, different types of woods, grasses, um, like fruit peels, things like that. So any sort of agricultural waste can be turned into biochar. Um, and it's seen as a very renewable, like uh, environmentally friendly uh, source of energy. And so we were looking at how putting that into the soil affects the tomato growth and post-harvest quality. So um, I, was, I was really fascinated to kind of see, it kind of broadened my horizons a bit because I was only focused on post-harvest and now I was actually looking at the growth cycle of tomatoes. So I was looking at more pre-harvest factors. And here on this side, you can see um, is a picture of actual biochar, so charcoal, which is a very carbon rich material and it's extremely porous. And because it is extremely porous, it, that's how it helps um, improve the soil quality because it helps with the water retention and the nutrient retention, and it keeps it more at a level where the plant can access it. And it, it actually did end up improving the post-harvest quality of our tomatoes and increasing the growth. So here's just some pictures from my research. Um, here's the different types of uh, soil media we had, we were looking at different concentrations of biochar. So you can see how they, how the color of the soil varies here. Um, and there I was working in the greenhouse. So this is the part where I was doing a little bit more field work than what I was used to because before this I was working in the lab a lot. And then here on the right is me um, actually doing a color analysis of the tomatoes. So after I finished this, um, my department gave me a fellowship to do a PhD, um, and that's how I that's how I ended up where I am. Um, so through a lot of these virtual career connections, um, we kind of like to hear about different hardships that especially women in STEM have to go through. So, kind of what are some of these that you've encountered, and how did you overcome that? Mm, okay, that's a really great question. So I would say, I would say that um, as a as a woman in STEM, I definitely encounter that a lot of the times I was the only female or one of the very few females in a lot of my courses. Um, and for me, I didn't really think anything of it because for me, I was 
just super interested in the material and and I didn't let you know my gender kind of affect the way like oh I won't answer or you know kind of hold me back in in courses and I think um I think a large part of this is because I did have some really good mentors. I've had some really good uh, female mentors um, in my career. Um, a lot, actually, most of them have been female. <laughs> For my undergrad uh, project, it was uh, she was a female, and then also currently, I have a female research mentor. So, I think having good mentors really makes a big difference in that aspect. And then also. Growing up where I grew up, I was also one of the very few minorities in, in my classes. So for, for me, it wasn't really anything new to, to be kind of a, a minority in that, in that regard. So I would say um, uh, mentoring and finding good mentors is very important. And then also, um, you know, when, you, when you're in the field of research and you're in graduate school and you're in a very like specific area, it's hard when you don't have um, any like anyone who's working in the place you want to work like any goal um because it is a very ambiguous kind of career path um so i would say that is one of the biggest challenges is that sometimes there's no clear path and there's many different routes to take and you know a lot of the times you just have to kind of take a chance um and and see you know what happens and it and then because of that i think mentoring is is very important talking to other people making connections and see kind of learning from them and their experience um, is what has helped me with some of the hardships that I have encountered. So I know, well, especially me, since I'm going into this, and I know a lot of the people who are watching are interested, maybe not specifically in this, but in maybe another STEM field or another uh, area of the agricultural production system. And so what's the best advice that you think you can give to us and others? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really great question. Um, well, my advice isn't very specific to the field of agriculture. I would say it's like very uh, general to, you know, being, being a young student and, you know, kind of exploring your options and like not knowing what you want to do. Uh, my biggest advice would be to to ask around like um, if there isn't an opportunity available ask ask someone um, for opportunities uh, if there's someone who has a job you think is really cool ask if you could job shadow them and also asking for informational interviews for me that has been extremely helpful because um, kind of like what we're doing right now you can ask them like what they do in a typical day what is their work life what has helped them the most. So I would say um, that has really helped me. That's actually how I got my, <coughs> my um, opportunity to do undergraduate research was kind of snowballed into this. <laughs> was I just actually, I Googled like who works in food science research at, at the university I was, it, at, I was at. Um, and then I found who it was. And then I just sent her an email. I said, this is my background. I'm really interested in what you do. Can I come? and you know, just shadow you for a day or like kind of learn about what you do. Um, and because of that, I, because of that, you know, they saw my background and then I was able to get a job there for a while as an undergraduate researcher. So for me asking um, and reaching out, like not being afraid to reach out has been really beneficial in terms of, um, of like exploring new options and, and kind of learning about the path where I am right now. And so we have a couple of questions. Okay. So um, let's see. So you mentioned that you have um, had multiple mentors and you've also been a mentor. So how do you think that has helped you either having them or being them just like now? Um, well, that's a really great question because actually mentoring other people has, I think, helped me a lot more uh, well, okay, I would say it's helped me just the same because, you know, when you see other people going through the same thing you're going through, you, you kind of, you realize things about yourself, like, okay, well, I was doing that too, and this is what helped me, so this is kind of what, what advice that you would be able to give, um, and, and because of that, I actually learned a lot more about myself, and so I think mentoring other people is not just a one-way, one-way thing, like, I think it also helps the mentor themselves, um, so uh, in my program, we actually have a mentoring program where we mentor new incoming graduate students 
Um, and then, you know, so I also had a mentor coming in and I think that has been incredibly beneficial in terms of like, not just career, but also like even personal choices and, you know, just career, uh, like your approach to life and things like that. And, you know, what may be holding you back. I think in that regards, it has been super helpful. And I've also had, like I said, a lot of mentors who were, who were women in STEM. And I think for me, that was really helpful because if I did have any reservations or any concerns, like I can get kind of advice from them and, you know, kind of what path they took and how, you know, how that kind of path would affect me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And also thank you for being here and mentoring everyone here. I know it's really helpful. And so we have a question coming in from the chat. So somebody noticed that you have been working with strawberries and tomatoes. So do you like to eat them even after working with them all day? That's a great question. So I would say that I have worked a lot longer with strawberries than I have with tomatoes. Um, and I actually did a lot more lab work with strawberries and tomatoes. So for me, I can eat strawberries, but it's, it's just the smell, you know, when I smell it, it just takes me back to the lab days, you know, when we're blending up the samples and putting them in the refrigerator for, for analysis later. So for me, um, it's definitely strawberries have a different, um, uh, memory associated with them for me now, but, but tomatoes, I, I wouldn't say so because, um, the context in which with, I worked with tomatoes was a, a way shorter amount of time. I didn't do too much lab work with them. I was working more in the greenhouse with them. And because of that, like, you know, the, it didn't really affect my, my choice or preference for tomatoes. Well, I also just wasn't like a big tomato person before that anyways, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Strawberries definitely have a different kind of, you know, memory associated with them for me. Yeah, I could see how that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what kind of extracurricular activities do you do along with your work and bringing that into science? Mm, that's a really good question. So I actually do a lot of um, extracurricular things academically. So I'm a part of different types of uh, student councils like for engineering students. And also um, I'm a part of our, our graduate program also has kind of a student council where we put on different types of events, activities and seminars to kind of uh, cultivate uh, a sense of like belonging for the students. Um, and then also at the county, countywide scale, the county that I live in, Alachua County, they, they have like some young professionals organizations. And, and as part of that, I was doing some diversity and inclusion stuff by, you know, spreading awareness of their group to a lot of the graduate students at the University of Florida, because that is a large population of Gainesville. So I, I would say being a part of those kinds of activities has really helped me like with the communication aspect, um, like uh, working with a team, uh, putting events together. I would say it's helped me in the more like soft skills uh, arena. And I think that really comes in handy when you're, when I'm doing events like this, where it's more like talking and communicating where you're not specifically talking to other scientists or other PhDs. So I think in that regards, it has really helped me. And another thing that I do on the side is I, I worked a little bit um, with different organizations to help with their uh, social media. And so kind of like the digital communication aspect. So um, I think that has been really helpful as far as like marketing yourself, because like, I, I feel like you could be doing really great things, you know, as a scientist, but if you don't publicize or if you don't like market them or, or communicate them, then, you know, it's not as effective. So I would say those kinds of things have really helped me kind of in my career. Yeah, and I think science communication a lot of times is overlooked, but sometimes it's, it can be just as important as the actual science. And so we have a question from Sandra Gutierrez, and she says, she asked how um, she can get in touch with you for another presentation or just in touch general, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. So I'll just reshare my screen, which has my contact information. I have my email and my Twitter handle there. And, and yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to do, you know, any more talks related to this area. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me via email or Twitter. Either of those things work. Awesome. And we ha also have a question from Mrs. Young 
asking, do you have any advice for elementary students who are passionate about STEAM? Passionate about STEM? STEM or STEAM, which okay. is, I think, arts. Okay, arts. okay, yeah, I've, I've heard of this, this term. Um, elementary school students, hmm. Um, I would say, I would say like a lot of what has helped me when I was younger was working on different types of projects because, um, you know, when you're in school, we learn a lot of theoretical knowledge, right? A lot of like abstract things, but when you work on a project, you actually kind of get to put it into action and, and you get to see the applied version of, of what you're learning. And I think for me, that was really helpful growing up. So, you know, being a part of these like science fairs or different projects, um, I think that was really helpful to me. And, and also just connecting with other people who, who have the kind of career that you want and who work in things that excite you, um, not being afraid to kind of, like I said, asking, um, asking for opportunities or, you know, informational interviews and things like that. Yeah, and I remember, I remember when I was in elementary school, probably my favorite thing to do was the science fair every year. So if their school does have a science fair, I would recommend that. And mm -hmm. so that was Mrs. Young class. I also wanted to give them a shout out. They're from San Diego, and they've been joining us for all our virtual events on YouTube. So hey, hi, Mrs. Young's class. You. Um, and then with that, I think we can wrap it up okay. and thank you so much thank you so much for this it was really really awesome to hear thank you guys for having me I'm so glad that you guys are holding this event you know in lieu of everything that is virtual I think for me it has been great that it is virtual because I finally get the opportunity to do this um, and I've had a lot of friends who who have done worked with scientists in every Florida school and they've they've had great experiences. So I'm really grateful that I was given this opportunity. Awesome, thanks. And so we'd also like to recognize our partners at Scientists in Every Florida School, a free program whose mission is to build relationships with teachers and scientists such as Ratna. And for more information about how you can get involved with scientists in every Florida school, check out their socials and website. So that's provided here. And then um, also be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo on our social media channels and visit earthecho.org to find out more about all of our information about our exciting programs, including upcoming virtual events, just like this one. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button before you go and you can get notifications. And on behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you for joining us and keep exploring. Bye. Bye.